Hi everyone, this is Ranjit and welcome to the third video in the Geom Algolib series. If you haven't seen the first two, I would strongly recommend that you go check them out. You should be able to find the link to the playlist in the description. So if you remember where we left off in the last video, we had created a, our basic project setup. We created a C++ project and a C-sharp DLL project. And we also managed to connect these two projects using pinvoke. We also managed to actually run our C++ code from within Grasshopper and get the results back. So between where the last video ended and where this video begins, I actually wrote some code and I actually chose not to make a video documenting the process of writing this code because it was, it was very basic code, just boilerplate stuff. And I didn't think it would make for a very interesting video. So what I'm going to do now is just give you guys a walkthrough of this code that I just added uh, between the videos and, and give you a high level view of what it is. And it's really simple. And if you're interested in going over the whole thing, you can find the link to the GitHub in the description. So we have a structure to represent three dimensional vectors, and it has everything that you would expect from a 3D vector your XYZ components, some static constants to represent standard vectors. So this is the zero vector and this is the unset vector. So I'm going to come back to this and talk about the unset vector in a second. Uh, we have our constructors and we have our operators. These are all like convenience operators for, for, for different things. But of all these operators, the only two operators that, uh, that I want to draw your attention to are these two. So the first one, the asterisk operator, we defined it to represent dot product between two vectors. And we have this operator, I've chosen to uh, have this operator represent a cross product. It's not the standard notation for, for cross product, but it works. It makes our vector math expression look a, a lot cleaner and we're not going to use this, exp this operator for anything else, so why not? And we have a method for getting the length of the vector, squared length of the vector, uh, method to copy the coordinates, check if the vector is zero, and check if the vector is valid. Okay, so what does it mean for a vector to be valid or invalid? So we want to be able to have the vector to have a, an uninitialized state. So that's what this uh, static constant unset represents. So if we go into the definition of this constant, it's a vector with the three coordinates set to uh, the maximum value of the double data type. So again, if I go to the definition of this macro, this macro is defined to represent the maximum value of the double data type. And if a vector has all three coordinates set to that maximum value, then we consider that an invalid uninitialized vector called unset, right? And if any vector has those coordinates, then we call we consider that vector to be invalid. And we have a function to return unit vectors. We have a function to re reverse the vector, reverse the direction of the vector. And by the way, if you find if you catch me like calling these functions methods, just don't worry about it. I mean functions. I just come from the world of .NET, so I'm just used to calling them methods. I try to change it, but it, habits don't change that fast. So we also have some uh, convenience methods for computing sums and averages of, of a collection of vectors. Okay, the next structure we have is an index pair. It is exactly what it sounds like. It's a pair of indices that we represent through the fields P and Q. It has some basic uh, operators for comparison, some basic constructors, a method to hash the index pair and the unset method actually removes an index let's say you have an index pair that holds the two indices five and seven so the value of p is five and value of q is seven and you want to remove seven from this pair so you call the uh, unset function and pass the value seven here and, and what does that actually do it takes the q field which was in, originally seven and sets it to negative one. So we're treating negative one as an unset value, just like we did with the unset field in vector. So 
you might be wondering why negative one because we're using the size t data type which on my 64-bit machine it expands to unsigned long long type it's unsigned which means there is no negative one so when we actually set q to negative one it causes integer underflow and it goes to the maximum value of that type so we want to treat that index as an invalid index so that's what unset does add just sets one of the indices uh, to the given value so you're just adding an index to the index pair uh, contains just checks if the given number is part of the index pair so this is very abstract you probably can't imagine why we would we would need such a data structure so we're going to represent let's say an edge using an index pair and the pair of indices that represent this edge are actually the coordinates of the vertices that you have to join to get this edge right so that actually brings us to one of the qualities of this index pair so if you have let's say vertex number five and vertex number seven and you join these two vertices to get an edge so you are getting the same edge irrespective of whether you join five to seven or seven to five it's the same edge what that means is that we need our index pair structure to be symmetric. So you will see the effects of, of this in our definitions of the comparison operators. So if we go into the definition of this equals operator, you can see that we, we are not just comparing P to the P of the other one and Q to the Q, but we're also doing the comparison uh, of P to the Q and Q to the P, because as long as the two indices are the same, we shouldn't worry about the order. We should consider these two pairs equal even if the order is different. So we apply the same logic in the inequality uh, operator and we also try to make our hash function symmetric. So it's p plus q plus p times q. So this hash doesn't change when you change the when you swap p and q. So you might be wondering, it's a symmetric hash, but it's not a very good hash function. This hash function would create a lot of conflicts. We don't really have to worry about hash conflicts in our case because uh, we're, we already overloaded the equality operator and we're going to use that in combination with the hash and that should sort things out. Uh, so that's the index pair structure and the next structure is what we call a triface and it represents a triangular face and when we start with our convex hull algorithm, the hull is going to be represented as a collection of these triangular faces. So every face has a unique ID. It's just a number that's unique to this face. And it has three indices A, B, C. And these three indices represent the indices of the vertices that you have to join to get this triangle. And each face knows its own normal and some basic constructors. Uh, we can check whether a face is valid or not. Uh, again, when you just initialize a face, like the default initializer, let's go into the definition. We set the ID and all the vertex indices to negative one, which due to integer underflow end up at the maximum value of our size T type. So we never expect to have a convex hull with that many faces. So we're going to treat uh, a face with those particular values uh, for the ID and the indices as an invalid face. So if we go into the definition of our is valid method, we're trying to check if the face is valid. And for this face to be valid, the ID and all the indices, they all have to be not equal to negative one. So that's the is valid method. And we have a flip method, which flips the face. So uh, the order of these three vertices determines the orientation of the face. And the convention that we're following here is that when you're looking at a face from outside the hull, the vertices should be sorted in counterclockwise direction. So what this flip method does, if we go into the definition is swap the vertex indices B and C that essentially flips the order of the vertices from counterclockwise to clockwise or vice versa. And it also reverses the normal. I don't know why I wrote it like this, but we could just call normal.reverse because we have a method to reverse a vector already. So I'm just going to make that small edit now. Okay, the next method is 
uh, the edge method for this triangular face it has three edges right one connecting a to b the second connecting b to c and the third connecting c to a so when you call this method and pass say edge index zero it will return the edge connecting a to b if you pass index one it will return the second edge which is the edge connecting b to c and the third edge is the one connecting c to a right and as you can see it returns an index pair because we represent edges as index pairs uh, this method checks if this face contains a vertex with a given index okay so that wraps up the three new structures that i added between the last video and this video okay we also created these two methods uh, one is called unsafe release int and the other one is unsafe release double and these are just convenience methods so once we start using our C++ algorithms from the C-sharp project, we're going to end up allocating some memory in our C++ code and using that data from C-sharp. And once we're done using, we, we need a way to tell C++, okay, I'm done using this data. You can release this memory that you've allocated. So that's what these methods are going to help us do. But before we can actually start writing the code for our convex hull algorithm, Let's just take a look at how the algorithm actually works so that we get a better idea of what we're doing. Okay, so the algorithm that we're going to be using is called Quick Hull or Quick Hull 3D because it's in 3D. And let's go through the steps of the algorithm one by one. Step one, create initial simplex and remove enclosed point from the outside point set. So the first step is to identify the extreme points in our collection of input points. So we are looking for points with the highest and lowest x coordinate, highest and low x, lowest y coordinate, uh, and so on. So once we have these extreme points, we try to create a tetrahedron from these points and we try to maximize the dimensions of this tetrahedron. This tetrahedron will serve as the seed for our loop that creates the actual hull. And as soon as we create this tetrahedron, some points will end up on the inside of this tetrahedron. So we're going to want to remove these points from all future consideration. Like these points will not contribute to anything in our algorithm going forward. So we might as well get rid of them to make, pro make the process more efficient. Step two is to queue up all the faces. So you take the tetrahedron you just created and you queue up all the faces and you start the loop, right? So from step three onwards, we're not going to talk about the tetrahedron, but we're going to talk about whatever hull we end up with for that iteration of the loop. So imagine we ended up with this icosahedron for our hull in a certain iteration. Then step three is to take a face from the queue. So let's say the face that we take is this the one that's facing the camera right now. And we go to step four, which is to identify the farthest point outside that face. So we go through all the points that are outside our hull and we identify the point that is farthest from the face and the face should also be visible from this point. If we don't find any point that satisfies these two conditions, then we just drop this face, go back to step three and take the next face. But if we do find a point that satisfies these conditions, then we move on to step five where we pop all the visible faces from this far point and identify the horizon edges. So when, when we pop all the visible faces, which is what happened in this picture, you end up with some naked edges, right? So these naked edges represent sort of the silhouette of the hull from this point. So if you're looking from this point, these naked edges represent the silhouette and we're calling them horizon edges because it sort of represents the horizon, right? The next step is to create new faces by connecting the far point to all the horizon edges. So for each horizon edge, we're going to get one new face. And we're going to next take all these faces that we've just created and add them back into our face queue, right? And because we removed some faces and added new faces, and more importantly, we increased the volume of our convex hull, some points that were outside the hull before now could end up inside the hull. So we're going to once again iterate through 
these points and delete the points that ended up on the inside of the hull, right? And then the last step, step nine, is to repeat the steps between three and eight until the phase queue is empty. And once the phase queue is empty, what we have is our final convex hull. So now that we know how the algorithm works, let's finally start writing some code. So I'm just going to add a class that will contain our convex hull implementation and I'm going to just call it convex hull. It creates the header file and the source file for us. And to this header file, let's start adding members to our class, uh, things that we're going to need in our algorithm, right? Let's start with the private members of the class. So the first thing we're going to need is a place to store all the points that we start with, the points that define the convex hull. So let's just store them in a vector. And to be able to use vector, we have to hash include the header file. And now we can use vector. And yeah, it's going to store all the points. So it's a vector of vectors. And okay, we also have to add the base header file. Okay, so let's call this member M points. And we're going to have to know how many points we have. I mean, obviously you can get the size of the vector, but it's also useful to just store it in a number, in a private member as a number. And we also need a place to store the center of our hull. It's a reference point that we can use anytime we want a point that's we know for sure is inside the convex hull. Right. So we're also going to need uh, some data structures to actually store the hull itself, because so far we've only wrote the data structure for the points. So what I mean by hull is the collection of triangular faces and, and the information about how they are connected and so on. So to store those, we're going to use unordered maps. And to actually use those, we also have to add another header file. Wait a minute, let me just check if we included vector already. Okay, we already included vector in our base, so we don't have to include it again here. So let's just remove that line. So we're going to use unordered map, and we will also need unordered set. So let's just include those two and create our first map. This is going to store the triangular faces. And the key of the map is going to be the ID of the triangular face. So as you can, as you know, each face has a unique ID and the value is going to be the face itself. And if you're wondering an unordered map, if you're not familiar with it, it's equivalent to what you would call a dictionary in C sharp. So this, because it stores all the faces, let's just call it M faces. And we're going to have another unordered map if I can manage to type it properly, that stores uh, the information about which faces are connected to which edges. So for this map, the for this map, both the key and the value are going to be index pair. So I'll explain why that is. So the key is the edge, right? We want to be able to look up, okay, for this edge, what are the faces that are connected to that edge, right? And how do we represent edges? We are going to represent edges as index pairs, where the indices are the vertices that you have to join to get that edge. And because we're making a convex hull, the mesh will be manifold and closed, except for when we pop the faces, but we also immediately just add new faces to make it closed again. So each edge will be connected to two other faces. So the faces that are connected to, the, connected to this edge can also be represented as an index pair, and the indices here being the IDs of the faces. So that's the second map we're going to need, and we're also going to need an unordered set. And in this set, we're just going to store some indices of the points that are outside the hull, and we're going to call it M outside points. And these, the points with these indices are the ones that we're concerned about. We don't want to process the points that are inside the hull because they don't contribute to anything. They don't contribute to the hull. As you can see, we 
ended up with two unordered maps and one unordered set. And these data structures, similar to their counterparts, which are dictionaries and hash sets in C-sharp, they depend on hashing and lookup, right? And we care about performance. We want our convex hull to be really fast. So we're going to customize the hashing functions used in these maps and in this set. So to do that, let's jump back for a second uh, into our base header file and declare some structs. These are essentially uh, what we're going to use to hash our keys. So we need to be able to hash index pairs. So let's just call this index pair hash. And to write a hasher structure in C++, you just have to write any structure and override the parentheses operator. So it's going to be operator parentheses. It's going to take the index pair that it has to hash as a parameter. And it's going to have these two keywords because uh, calling this function doesn't actually change anything about this structure because so const keyword and you're not supposed to throw anything from inside this inside the definition of this operator so we also have no except keyword so let's just define uh, this so because uh, our index pair structure already has a hash function uh, we can just use that we just return the hash. So that's simple enough. And we're going to have another structure for hashing size t. So, okay, let's jump back into our convex hull and actually use these custom hashes. So in this, we're going to have to use the custom size t hash because the key is size t. And let's also use the uh, default equal to implementation that we can find in the standard library. So earlier I mentioned how uh, our hashing functions don't need to be like super good. We can we can afford to generate some hash conflicts because whenever you generate hash conflicts, it uses this equal to method to resolve those conflicts, right? And we're just using the default equal to uh, for implemented inside the standard library. And for this, we're going to use our index pair hash hasher. And we're going to once again use the equal to that's defined in the standard library. If you want to know like what's exactly going on inside this equal to def equal to implementation in the standard library, you can just go into the definition and you can see that what it's doing essentially is just compare the two values that that it gets using the equality operator. So if we go into the definition of our index pair, we overloaded this equality operator, so we don't have to worry about it. It will just use this overloaded operator and it should work just fine. And let's also use custom hashing for our set. So what you see on the screen right now is all the data structures that we need to store and process our convex hull. So we have data structure for the points, for the faces, and to store the connectivity information of, of the edges and the faces. And the next thing that we want to do is start writing functions and constructors for our convex hull class. And that's where we will start in the next video. So with that, I'll wrap up this video. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.